Chapter Eighteen of The Caves of Fear by John Blaine. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Chapter Eighteen The Hostages. A faint splashing warned Rick that the boats were approaching. In a few moments they were opposite his position. He swung the infrared light around toward them and snapped it on. There were two men in the lead boat, one rowing and the other taking his ease in the stern. Rick's heart leapt as he saw that the passenger was of very slender build. Was it Long Shadow? He couldn't see his face clearly. He looked at the second boat, and a sudden grin split his lips. Worthington Co. The Chinese merchant was sitting at ease, and there was no mistaking his portly figure. Besides, he twisted on the wooden seat, making himself more comfortable, and for an instant his face was toward Rick. Good, Rick muttered to himself. If the slender man wasn't Long Shadow, at least he would have Ko to deal with. The Chinese with the glass eye could, he knew, speak English, although it was probable that Long Shadow could too. He watched as the boats reached the barge. Ko and the slender man got out. Rick studied the stranger, noting that he was taller than Ko, and so thin that, compared with the portly merchant, he looked like an animated bean-pole. He, surely, must be Long Shadow, Rick told himself. As soon as the excitement of their arrival had died down among the Tibetans, he intended to get into his boat and start toward the camp. Ko and the stranger talked together for a moment. Then the latter gestured toward the Tibetans. The Tibetans ran toward the tents while the two newcomers waited. Rick watched the Tibetans, his brow furrowed. Surely they weren't going to strike camp. He revised his plans hastily. If they did start to take down the tents, he would dump his prisoner back in the boat. Then he would follow wherever they went. The Tibetans vanished into the tents, and in a moment they came out again. And they were leading Scotty, Zircon, and Shada. Rick gasped. His friends had been in the camp all the time, prisoners. He groaned softly. If he had only known, he might have gotten to them while the boats were gone and the number of guards was temporarily reduced. He got to his knees determined to start for them right away. Then he paused as his three friends were led before the two strangers. They were all erect, their hands tied behind them. Anyway, prisoners or not, they were evidently none the worse for their captivity. Again he started for the boat, and again he paused. What if Long Shadow and Co. intended loading them in the boats? It might be wiser to wait. He sank down to a sitting position, caressing the cold metal of his rifle. The next few moments would tell the story. Worthington Ko stepped forward, confronting Zircon. The Chinese nodded his head, then deliberately slapped the scientist across the face. Zircon couldn't strike back, but his legs were free. One massive leg swung in a giant punt that caught the Chinese squarely in the stomach. Worthington Co. flew backward like a rag doll and slid along the limestone floor. Rick watched the tableau, spellbound. The Tibetans ran forward. Rick put the camera down, light pointing at the group across the way. Then he raised his rifle and sighted in. He'd get some of them before they could harm his friends. His finger tightened slowly on the trigger. And then the Tibetans fell back as Long Shadow barked an order. Worthington Ko got to his feet, bent over, both hands on his stomach. He weaved a little. The breath had been knocked right out of him, Rick thought. The Tibetans and Long Shadow watched as Ko straightened up, very slowly. He ran his hands gingerly over his big stomach. Then... Walking unsteadily, he moved back to within a few feet of Zircon. He called out something, and one of the Tibetans ran forward. Rick's throat clogged as the torchlight reflected from a shiny blade. Ko took the blade and swished it through the air. Then, drawing it back, he stepped forward. 
the Chinese was squarely in Rick's sights. He squeezed the trigger, and the rifle recoiled against his shoulder. The shot thundered through the echoing cave. Ko staggered. He dropped the blade, took a couple of hesitant steps backward, and then sat down hard. There was sudden chaos in the camp across the way. The Tibetans ran back and forth aimlessly like sheep. Long Shadow bellowed orders. Then he ran to a torch, pulled it out of the socket, and heaved it into the water. The Tibetans got the idea. The torches flashed through the air and then hissed out in the water. Long Shadow felt his way toward the three spindrifters, calling out orders to the Tibetans. Rick suddenly realized that, of all in sight, only he could see. Long Shadow and his men thought they were safe in the darkness. He watched, rifle at his shoulder, as Long Shadow collected the Tibetans. Then he realized that the enemy intended herding Scotty, Zircon, and Chada into the caves. Probably they were certain that in the caves they would be safe from whoever had fired from the darkness. Ko was still sitting. He had one hand pressed to his side. The Tibetans were groping for their prisoners. Rick grinned. He aimed at the stone under their feet and fired. There was a chorus of yells. He levered another cartridge into the chamber and fired again. The Tibetans fled, charging blindly toward the cave openings beyond the tents. Long Shadow kept yelling orders, groping around in the blackness, but the Tibetans paid no attention. They reached the back wall of the cave. Two of them went headlong into openings. Others crashed into the walls, fell, crawled sideways, scrambling until they found the openings they so frantically sought. Long Shadow's voice could be heard screaming in fury for his men to come back. He couldn't see, as Rick could, that they were all now in the caves behind their leader. Finally, giving up, Long Shadow started for safety himself. It would never do to allow the thin man to get away, Rick thought. He wanted Long Shadow. He and his companions had questions to ask him, and they needed him to get them out of the caves of fear. He sighted carefully at the long legs that were feeling their way toward the back wall. He fired. Long Shadow stumbled headlong. Then he started to crawl. Rick stood up and yelled, Gang! Get Long Shadow! His words echoed eerily through the cave. Zirkin understood and bellowed, Where is he? Rick thought quickly. The three were still standing in a line. He shouted orders. Right face, forward, march. Like a well-trained machine, his friends obeyed. They marched forward steadily. But they were slightly off. He remembered the correct command. Left oblique, march. Scotty swung a quarter left, bumped into Zircon. Chada stood still, not understanding. Neither had Zircon comprehended the command. Rick yelled, Scotty. Turn right just a fraction. Scotty did so. Now, Rick called. He's about ten feet in front of you. Scotty moved forward, feeling his way a step at a time. When he was almost on Long Shadow, Rick yelled, You're there! Long Shadow turned over on his back and clawed in his pockets. Watch out! Rick screamed. He's got a gun! Scotty jumped feet first. He missed Long Shadow by a fraction, landing next to his chest. Fall to the left, Rick yelled. Scotty crashed down across the man, calling to Zircon and Chada. Guided by their friend's voice, the two reached his side quickly. Rick couldn't hear what Scotty said, but the big scientist suddenly sat down, his back to Long Shadow. A moment later, he writhed away, and he had the pistol between his bound hands. Rick sighed his relief. Wait, he yelled. I'll be right there. He didn't dare take his eyes off the scene long enough to pick up his prisoner. Time enough for that later. He'd untied the boat and got in. He knelt, placing the rifle on the seat in front of him next to the infrared camera. Then, using the oar as a paddle once more, he started straight across to the camp. It wasn't a far journey. 
but as he reached the halfway mark, two of the Tibetans looked cautiously out of their hiding place. Rick put the oar across the gunwales, picked up his rifle, and sighted carefully. Fortunately, there wasn't so much as a ripple on the water. The boat was perfectly steady. He squeezed the trigger, and the stalactite directly over their heads shattered into a thousand pieces, showering them with limestone. They didn't wait for a second shot. You could hear their yells even after they had ducked back into the caves. They weren't used to sharpshooting in total darkness. Rick smiled as he resumed paddling. He could understand how they felt. He wasn't used to it either. In a few moments, he was at the barge. He tied the boat to one of the odd derrick affairs and scrambled out. Then, picking up the camera and rifle, he hurried to his friends. Scotty and Shada were using Long Shadow as a bench. Zircon sat a little distance apart, trying to peer toward Rick through the darkness. Dark in here, isn't it? Rick inquired pleasantly. Rick, you old muttonhead! Scotty exclaimed. Thank God you're safe, Zircon said. Chada grinned the widest grin ever and said, Also giving much thanks that friend Rick has eyes like cat which see in dark. The Hindu boy didn't know about the infrared camera unless the others had explained it to him. There hadn't been time back at camp, and Rick hadn't thought of it anyway. In a moment, the three were untied, rubbing circulation back into their wrists. Let's get a light, Zircon said. I think we had better see to the wounded. I assume there are wounded. I know Ko was hit, and just as he was about to carve my head from my shoulders, too. He's sitting over there, Rick said. Where's there? Scotty asked. He kept forgetting that only he could see. Where he dropped. Long Shadow is hit, too. I don't know how badly. For the first time, they heard their enemy's voice. It was rather high, but cultured and pleasant. Not badly. Although I believe my ankle may be broken, I have felt, and I don't believe I am bleeding much. Rick knelt quickly and put the infrared light on the wound. Long Shadow was right. It hadn't bled much, and Zircon, looking the wound over after borrowing the glasses, told him, I doubt that the ankle is broken. The wound is clean. Stay where you are, Rick warned him. We'll bandage you after we look at Ko. I have no intention of going anywhere, Long Shadow said. Not when some magic I don't understand permits you to see in complete darkness. Rick took the glasses from Zircon's hand. In the interval, during which the scientist was wearing them, he had understood how the others felt. The darkness was absolute. He put the glasses on again and walked over to Ko, talking so his friends could follow the sound of his voice. Well, Mr. Ko, he said, you got a little surprise, didn't you? The Chinese with the glass eye groaned. You have won, he complained weakly. Now have the kindness to let me go to my ancestors in peace. Better let me take a look at him, Zircon said. Rick walked to the scientist's side and took one of his hands. Then he took off the glasses and pressed them into the hand he was holding. That done, he stood in the blackness and waited. Lie flat, presently Zircon said. Please go away, Ko groaned. Lie flat. There was the sound of ripping cloth. Zircon grunted. Hmm. Ko moaned. I wish to go to my ancestors alone. You're not going to your ancestors, Zircon replied scornfully. I doubt that they'd have you. In case you're interested, Rick's bullet merely plowed a nice round hole through some of the fat on your right side. You haven't even lost enough blood to make the wound interesting. Ko's voice was suddenly animated. Are you sure? Quite sure. Now, don't try to get up. Stay where you are. If you try to run, I'll order our seeing-eye marksman to finish the job. 
Zircon continued. Rick, Scotty, Chada, stay where you are. I saw some torches stacked in one of the tents. I'll get them and be right back. The three boys assured him that they wouldn't move. Rick, for one, had no intention of prowling about in the blackness. While they waited, Scotty asked, What happened to you, Rick? Rick hesitated. He couldn't give an adequate account of what he had experienced during the recent hours. Or was it weeks? He summed it up. After we got separated, I couldn't find you again. I wandered around. Then I sat down in a big cave and fell asleep. When I woke, there was a Tibetan with a candle. I followed him to a boat landing, slugged him, and rowed across the lake. He's waiting, tied up across the lake, at the spot from where I fired. How about you? We look for you, Chada said. We look a long time, and almost get lost ourselves. Finally, we decided we'd better push on and find Long Shadow, Scotty continued. We tracked the drippings from the candles for hours. It was slow work. Then, while we were resting, we got jumped from behind. They didn't even have to bother about lights, because one of our flashlights was on, and it was getting so weak we couldn't see more than ten feet. They came out of the darkness with a rush, and there we were. They made us walk to the boat landing, called the boats from here, and brought us over. We've been sitting in one of those tents for hours. You know the rest. How rapidly they could cover the tortured hours of travel in a few words, Rick thought. But he said only, I'm glad we're all together again. How you see in dark? Chada asked. Rick explained briefly. The Hindu boy chuckled. Plenty of mystery for one who not know, you bet. I scared myself, like the men who ran. Then Zircon came back. He brought out matches, and in a moment, torches were blazing again. They bandaged the two enemies as best they could, using clean handkerchiefs, which Chada and Scotty carried, and Rick got his first good look at Long Shadow's face. The man was incredibly thin. His skin was stretched over the bones of his face like parchment, and it had a sallow, ivory tinge even in the ruddy torchlight. His eyes were black, with just the faintest hint of a mongoloid fold. "'Are you a Eurasian?' Rick asked bluntly. "'Yes,' Long Shadow smiled. "'I'm one quarter Burmese. The other three quarters doesn't matter.' You know our names, Rick said. I'm sure you do, but we don't know yours. Long Shadow laughed. You could never pronounce my Burmese name, and the other name I use is of no importance. Zircon and the others had been listening. Now the scientist said, We'll have plenty of chance to talk, Rick. At the moment I'm concerned with getting out of here. After a bit of exploration, of course. It's almost certain that the heavy water comes from here, although I don't know the source. Scotty motioned toward the lake of darkness. Bradley said to bring a Nansen bottle and a rubber boat. He must have known about this. Why would he say to bring a Nansen bottle if not to take a sample from the lake? Zircon flashed a look at Long Shadow. The Eurasian smiled gently. That's a good question, Mr. Scott asked. He told them, but don't look to me for the answer. Search the tents, Zircon ordered. Chada, keep an eye on our two friends. The three Americans walked to the felt tents and began searching through them. Zircon used the infrared camera. Rick and Scotty took torches. Rick was feeling through a pile of furs when Zircon called. Here are the flashlights. Zircon's had run down, but Scotty's and Chada's big lights were still useful. They made the search much easier. Rick went back to the pile of skins and found that they were plastic-lined water bags, similar to the ones they had found on the way to Corsa Lincoln. Then, stacked in a corner of the tent, he found some Nansen bottles. At the same moment, Scotty called from the next tent. Look what I found! 
he had located the ammunition supply there was powder and ball for the old muskets the tibetans used two boxes of machine pistol cartridges and a small case of grenades now we know where ko got the one he tried to use on us rick said but where did they come from in the first place the war scotty guessed there must be tons of ammo and ordnance of all kinds floating around china what makes me wonder is why the tibetans don't have modern rifles i suspect the answer is their natural conservatism Zircon suggested they are slow to change and such guns as they use are handed down from father to son i don't doubt that modern rifles were offered them and that they refused rick knew something of the oriental mind although not much and he realized that zircon was probably right in a land of ancestor worship change was resisted scotty stuffed grenades in each pocket just in case we get into a fight on the way out he explained rick was glad to leave the deadly things to his friend scotty knew about grenades from his tour of duty in the marines he had thrown more than a few himself nansen bottles in the next tent professor rick said there must be something to this business of getting stuff out of the lake but golly you don't get heavy water out of natural water do you i don't know zircon said there is only one precedent i can think of have you ever heard of lake bacal neither boy had it's a very large lake in siberia just above mongolia the scientist told them it is also very deep a few years ago before the iron curtain closed down word came out of russia that some scientists had succeeded in getting heavy water samples out of bakal this is the only precedent that i know it is true he continued that heavy water has a tendency to sink naturally enough since it is heavier but for enough to form on the bottom of a body of water there would have to be a great depth and complete calm any current would stir the water up and the heavy water would merge with the normal once more in other words you need a lake like this one rick concluded i must admit it fits the requirements zircon agreed and we've seen no sign of an industrial plant these caverns certainly would be no place for one we can soon tell scotty suggested let's take a sample when we get out you can test it quite right zircon said and let's be quick about it it didn't take long to discover the reason for the odd little derricks on the barge each was equipped with a pulley and a reel of wire obviously it was from here that the nansen bottles were lowered when chada and scotty remained on shore zircon and rick pushed the barge out into the lake rick got a nansen bottle ready the bottle was made of metal each end equipped with a spring cap the bottle was lowered on a wire with the ends open permitting water to flow through it freely when it reached the desired depth a metal weight called a messenger was attached to the wire and dropped the weight of the messenger released devices that closed the caps thus trapping the water sample inside a brass spigot on the side permitted the sample to be taken out easily when the bottle was hauled up again they had brought four bottles from long shadow's stores the first one was lowered to the very bottom and it took a long time getting there the reel of wire with which the barge was equipped ran out and out until a full seven hundred feet of it had disappeared into the dark depths of the lake rick was glad the reel of wire had a geared handle pulling that weight up would be no fun once the slackening of the wire told them that bottom had been reached zircon put the messenger on the wire and let it go seconds later a tug on the wire told them that it had struck and rick reeled in other samples were taken at five ten and fifteen feet from the bottom zircon marked the bottles 
Then they paddled back to shore. Long Shadow spoke up. Of course, you have testing equipment? At our camp near Corsa Lincoln, Zircon assured him. You'll find what you expect, the Eurasian said. Thank you, and now we'll also thank you to lead us out of here. No, Long Shadow said. You're beaten, Zircon said reasonably. Why not admit it and cooperate? We've nothing against you, even if there were law in Tibet. See us to the outside and open the barred gate, and you're at liberty to go. Rick started to protest. Then he realized Zircon was right. Law in this part of the world was the law of the rifle. There was nothing they could do to Long Shadow or Co. Long Shadow considered. I suppose you're right. My little business deal is over, at least for the time being. He raised his voice and yelled in Tibetan. The boys grabbed at their rifles as Tibetan heads showed from the caves, black eyes blinking in fear. They will carry me and Ko, Long Shadow said calmly. Now let us be on our way. He smiled. I must admit I have a selfish interest in all this worry about getting to the outside. This ankle is beginning to hurt, and I won't mind having one of the lamas with medical skill take a look at it. How about letting a Hong Kong police doctor take a look at it? Rick asked. Long Shadow's cheerfulness was getting on his nerves. The man acted more like a guest than a prisoner. I don't think we need go that far, Long Shadow replied. The lamas are quite capable. I wasn't concerned about your ankle, Rick corrected. I was thinking that the Hong Kong police might like to get their hands on the kind of citizen who goes around shooting up hotels with a Schmeisser machine pistol. Long Shadow stopped smiling abruptly. You couldn't prove that, he said swiftly. Why not? Scotty asked. We'll let the police see if the slugs from your machine pistol don't match those in the hotel wall. By the way, where is the Schmeiser? I haven't seen it around. Long Shadow recovered his grin. You'll never see it again. I took the precaution of disposing of it, in case the police in the hotel area had been alerted. Don't bother to ask me how I got rid of it. We won't. Zircon replied, obviously you wouldn't tell us. However, perhaps you will tell us how long it will take to get out of here. About ten minutes. At their evident surprise, Long Shadow added, I should have said, once we cross the lake, it will take about ten minutes. You came a very long way around, you see. I realize you followed the candle droppings, but I'm afraid those were left some time ago, when I first explored the cave. The first entrance you tried was the correct one, even though you didn't suspect the presence of a door. When you took the open way, you approached by a very twisting path. Just to satisfy my curiosity, Scotty asked, why did your men capture us, then bundle us into the boats and bring us here? And where were you all that time? Long Shadow shrugged. I knew your guide and bearers were outside. At Corsa Lincoln, of course. My men have kept an eye on you. I also felt they probably would start a search after you failed to return. It was almost certain they would find the entrance to the caverns behind the Black Buddha, and, like you, they would probably follow the candle drippings. The drippings would lead them nowhere. Unless they found the secret door, there would be no chance of them finding you here in our permanent camp. Hence, I had brought you here. Ko and I were waiting in the cave I used for an office. When we thought time enough had elapsed for my orders to be carried out, we came here. Meanwhile, we took a nap. Are you satisfied? You never intended that we should see daylight again, Rick stated. He winked at his friends. Suppose we tie a few stalactites to your feet, 
and coes and see how long it takes for you to get down to where the heavy water is. He looked meaningly at the lake. Ko groaned, but Long Shadow only smiled. If that's the way you want it, he said, it will at least be quick. Both of us are done for, whether you know it or not. Your Mr. Bradley will see to that. As Long Shadow had said, it was little more than ten minutes after crossing the lake before the party reached the cave under the Black Buddha. They had passed through the cave where Rick had found the Tibetan. Again he realized how lucky he had been. Some good angel had led him to the main route. Had he fallen asleep in some other cave, he might still be wandering through the labyrinth. The rifles taken from Scotty and Zircon by Long Shadow's men had been found in one of the tents. With Rick's rifle they were insurance against treachery, but Long Shadow seemed resigned for some reason Rick couldn't fathom, and Ko did nothing but curse the bearers who carried him. Before reaching the great cave, they stopped at a blank wall. At a signal from Long Shadow, one of the Tibetans reached behind a stalagmite and pulled the lever. A section of the wall swung open, disclosing the passage they had thought stopped in a dead end. In a few moments, they were crossing the outer cave, and Rick saw at once that the bars across the entrance passage were gone. When the inner door opens from the inside, the bars also open, Long Shadow said. There is another cave under this one where the mechanism is located. No, I am not responsible. The ancient ones who made the Black Buddha also made the doors and the mechanism. Rick ran ahead through the passage. He found the leather thong that controlled the door and pulled. The metal tongue came out of its slot, permitting the counterbalance to swing the trap door upward. The others were behind him with their lights, and Rick saw his shadow loom large on the wall behind the Black Buddha. In the same way, the long shadow had been projected upward, probably by the light from a candle in the hands of the Tibetan bearer. He experimented, backing down a few steps. His shadow seemed to fold downward into the oblong box of light cast by the flashlights. When he walked up the stairs again, the shadow grew out of the bottom of the projected oblong of light. As Rick reached floor level, he froze suddenly, his fingers slipping the hammer of his rifle to full cock. There were lights in the cave. As he turned to call a warning, yellow-robed llamas, who had seen the reflected light on the rear wall, poured around the statue with wild yells, their torches held high. Something's up, Rick called to the others. Watch it! Under the threat of Rick's rifle, then Scotty's and Zircon's, the llamas fell back until the group stood alongside the Black Buddha, looking into the cave. There were torches everywhere, and cooking fires. Rick's first thought was that they had returned in the midst of a religious celebration. And then he saw Sing. The Chinese guide ran to them, his face split by a wide grin. You came! he exclaimed happily. We were about to tear the mountain down stone by stone. Where is the Indian boy? Chada came from behind the statue, herding the Tibetans who carried Long Shadow, Ko, and the Nansen bottles. Singh turned and yelled. The lamas broke into cries of approval at the sight of Chada. Several of them ran to him and pressed his hand. He was a favorite, obviously. They came to help when I told them the Indian boy was in danger, Singh explained. We were ready to start digging holes to find the caverns, because we couldn't find the door. He eyed Long Shadow curiously and grinned at the sight of Ko. Should I get my frying pan again? he asked. Might be a good idea, Rick said. My boss not come yet? Chada asked. Singh clapped hands to his head in a gesture of self-annoyance. I forgot. A letter came. One of the consulate guards, a Chinese who knows this part of the world, brought it from Chongqing. It may be from Mr. Bradley, because it came originally from Hong Kong. Zircon took the envelope while Rick, Scotty, and Chada looked over his shoulder. 
The envelope was marked for delivery from Hong Kong to Chongqing via diplomatic pouch. It was addressed to Zircon with the note, Urgent, forward by messenger. Bradley's initials were signed to it. The scientist ripped the envelope open, and, looking around to be sure, Long Shadow and Co. were out of earshot, he read, Have all the answers except the source. When you find it, destroy it, if possible. If you get Long Shadow or Worthington Co., don't bother bringing them back to Hong Kong, if they're still alive. Leave them at Corsa Lincoln. Cable me from Chongqing when you return. It was signed, Bradley. I like his confidence in us, Zircon remarked. Not if, but when. My boss does not know what it means to fail, Chada said. I can see one failure, Zircon remarked. How does one destroy a body of water? Scotty's forehead wrinkled thoughtfully. Couldn't we stir it up? The heavy water is all at the bottom. If we could give it a stir, the heavy stuff would mix with the rest. But would maybe settle right back? Chada objected. Not for a few thousand years, Zircon said. A good idea, Scotty. Do you happen to have a spoon seven hundred feet long? Scotty grinned. Yes, Mr. Co. supplied one. He reached into his pocket and pulled out a grenade. These will do the best job of stirring that black cup of tea that you've ever seen. Capital! Zircon exclaimed. They'll do perfectly, Scotty. He looked at the boys. Who wants to go back? Singh spoke up. I will go, and some of the lamas should too. The monastery should know all about these caves in case something like this ever happens again. He spoke to the lamas in Tibetan. They consulted briefly, then nodded assent. Five of them stepped forward. And Scotty and I will go, Rick volunteered. I want to see how this spoon works. He looked at Long Shadow and Co. Maybe they ought to go back and see the end of their racket, whatever it is. No need, Zircon said. They know it's the end, and Bradley does too, which is more than we know, I must say. But we'll find out from Bradley very soon. Rick hefted his rifle. Incidentally, there's one thing I want to do before we go back. And that is? He grinned at the scientist. I want to go hunting blue sheep. Me too, Scotty chimed in. Zircon chuckled. Very well. One day for sheep before we hit the trail. Since Bradley prohibits our taking revenge on the enemy, we'll take it out on the local livestock. Now get going and do a thorough job. End of chapter 18